our Lord. This is the beginning of Holy Week. So we start with Palm Sunday today. We welcome Jesus into our hearts, into the city, and crown him, proclaim him as King. Why don't you stand with us?
poverty of sin, poverty of the mind. And they found this Savior, Jesus, walking their streets. And they welcomed him with open arms and he got on a donkey and he came in and they celebrated the king. They said, this is him, Hosanna, praise God. Because he's here. The great thing is, we don't have to wait for that king. Amen? He's already here. We can lift him up every day as king of our hearts, king of our life.
guys. Appreciate that. Hope you come this morning expecting a blessing and worshiping the Lord together. So good to have you all with us today. And if you will, uh, if you have a bulletin, just a couple of announcements for you. Um, there's one item in the bulletin that actually is not in the bulletin I wanted to make mention to you. Uh, Brother Joe handed me this morning and said, we have new carpet for the fellowship hall. It's on order. Um, and we need to do a little maintenance in that room first before we can put the carpet in. So it uh, needs a little bit of prep work and some painting. But before we do the painting, we need to do the prep work. So on Saturday, April the 30th, we need a few people to do some of the prep work. If you could help out in the fellowship hall just to kind of get ready for the painting. Uh, that's April the 30th. That's a Saturday. And then Saturday, uh, May 7th, we need volunteers who would like to utilize your painting gifts if you would like to do some painting. And uh, we won't leave Todd all by himself to do all that. So uh, we'd like to get some volunteers to help out paint in there. And uh, we will be providing lunch. So a uh, good time of fellowship. You can serve here at the church a little bit, uh, but we do need to know if you'd like to help out. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer so that we have the right amount of materials and things like that, rollers, paintbrushes, that kind of thing, um, to uh, have that available. So if you have any questions, you can see Brother Joe, and he'll, uh, he'll point you in the right direction and help you out if you have any questions there. Also, don't forget, uh, there is no Awana or youth group this Wednesday, April the 13th, um, so remember that uh, so you don't come to an empty parking lot. Uh, also, Operation Christmas Child, April's focus this, this month is uh, it's toys, outdoor toys to be specific. So anything like, um, you know, soccer balls, baseballs, basketballs, football, that kind of thing. Um, any kind of a, a fun thing, maybe chalk. Um, you can uh, look there in the bulletin. If you have any questions about that, you can also see uh, Christina and Bobby Wells uh, in regards to that too. And, of course, uh, don't forget about Good Friday service. We will be having that this week. Uh, this Friday at 7 o'clock here at the church, and uh, we'll be doing communion and just a, a wonderful time of worship. So please join us for that. Uh, that, obviously, the following Sunday is Easter Sunday, and uh, looking forward to that. And of course, um, we will be having a breakfast, a uh, Easter Sunday morning breakfast at 930 and so join us for that. We're going to have biscuits and gravy, among other things. But I am just making sure I know biscuits and gravy. Uh, that's what I'm coming for. So um, mark that on your calendar. Be here, 9.30, biscuits and gravy. And then we can all come in here and fall asleep together. How about that? I won't leave you by. I'll, maybe I'll fall asleep with you. I'll just come right down there with you. Uh, home plate uh, this year. Uh, we're going to be going out to Tiger Stadium. And uh, there was a sign-up sheet. And uh, that has past due uh, now, but um, we do have a meeting about that. Anybody that signed up, I need you to meet with me on April the 24th, right after service. Uh, we're going to go over some details about that if you signed up, and uh, make sure that uh, the payments get in no later than that Sunday as well. And you'll be giving me those payments, and I'll keep track of all of that and make sure our treasurer gets, uh, gets all the monies for that. Uh, vacation Bible school, uh, Bible school volunteer meeting. That is today, following service. So if you'd like to volunteer for VBS, please stay after for that meeting today. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get you kind of going in the right direction. Sister Carrie Cup and Jenny will answer those questions if you have any. But uh, please, you know, please stay after uh, for that today. All right, with that, I want you to bow with me for a word of prayer. And we're going to get into the word. You guys good with that today? Amen. Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, uh, we just come to you today. We thank you for... Uh, this time of fellowship and reading your word and studying together, we ask and pray that you would, as always, just allow your word to find a place in our hearts and our lives. Just let it just move in us, Father, your Holy Spirit, speaking to us uh, exactly what you need us to hear today. And I ask this, Father, in your Son's name, amen. If you will, turn in your Bible with me to Luke chapter 19, uh, verses 37 to 44, very familiar scripture to most of us if you've been in church a while, and uh, we're going to be talking about Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem uh, on that Palm Sunday, of course, that's what we celebrate today in Palm Sunday, and uh, I want to just take a look at a few different aspects of that if we can, but let's read this together, Luke chapter 19, and I'm going to put it up on the screen for you as well. Starting at uh, verse 37, it says, And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. 
saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. You know, I, I know that many of you probably like myself. How many of you guys like sports? Baseball, basketball, football, you know, sports in general, golf. Um, you know what I, I've always, I don't know if you guys ever noticed this, I've always found it so fascinating how different people can have completely different reactions to the same exact situation at a game. Whether it's a play, you know, a good play, bad play, interception thrown, or, you know, something like that, uh, uh, you know, whatever it might be, or, a, you know, a win or a loss, people have, you know, they, they react completely different. There's three, there's usually three different groups of people at a sporting event. Um, usually there's those who are happy because uh, a team won, you know, that's usually their team, their team won. Then there's those who are unhappy, they're sad because their, their team lost. And then, of course, you also have those that are there who really, maybe they didn't really have any kind of vested interest at all. They didn't really care who won or lost. They were just kind of there as observers. You know, it was, it was more like a social event. They were there to hang out with friends or it wasn't really have any, didn't have anything to do with the game at all. Just maybe more of a social, a social thing. And, and today, again, of course, it's Palm Sunday. The day we remember Jesus, when he entered into Jerusalem, it's a week before his crucifixion. And just like at some sporting event we would go to, you've got these three distinct groups of people there. There's those who saw victory in the fact that Jesus was coming there. There were those who saw it as, really it was tragedy. And then there were those who saw simply, they just kind of missed out. They missed what was really going on. They, they didn't really see what was happening. They saw really uh, no significance to Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, they were really focused on the coming Jewish holiday of Passover. That's what they were thinking about. And, and so they didn't really think much about Jesus at the time and what he was, where, you know, where, why he was there and what that meant. And, and I want us to do that today. I want us to consider these three groups of people and how that relates to us and how that speaks to us in our lives in the time that we live today. I want you to first consider this. Confed consider the people who saw victory when Jesus entered that city. Think about them for a second. Let's take a look here. These are those who received Jesus. Okay, they received him. How many of you guys know that there's victory in those who receive Jesus? Amen? Amen. So verse 37, it says, And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I love this. Listen, a week before the cross, Jesus enters Jerusalem. What does he enter to? Shouts of praise. Right? Shouts of praise and worship. This was to them a triumphal entry. This was victory. It's going to happen. It was at that time that Jesus was actually at the height of his public ministry. So people knew, they had heard, he was recognized as being the Messiah. I mean, listen, in Matthew it says, Hosanna to the son of David. In Mark, his gospel, he says, it says, Hosanna, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. In John it says, they were, they were all saying, blessed is the king of Israel. See, the word Hosanna means save us now. Save us now, today, save us. And it was really an expression of praise and, and so these crowds, they, I mean, think about it. They recognized this group of people for who Jesus was. Why? Because of all the miracles that they had seen him do. They had witnessed the power. They had witnessed his authority over life, over death, over physical things, over nature. They witnessed all of his miracles. 
And they, they saw his authority. They saw the power of the gospel. Jesus' life. Okay? Now, this is what's amazing. Just a week later, just a week later, a similar scene takes place on a cross. You say, well, how is it similar? Well, one of, the, one of, one of those themes that was nailed behind, uh, beside Jesus, he accepts him as Lord, doesn't he? He recognized his crime. He knew that he was getting really exactly what he deserved at the time. He had broken the law, and he was being punished for it. He saw that. He recognized that. His Hosanna, though, was him declaring his faith, wasn't it? He was declaring his faith in Jesus. He was trusting in Jesus. He said to Jesus, he was a thief, and he said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Save me now. That's what he was trying to say, right? He was saying, save me now, save me right now. And Jesus responded to that request with a promise of salvation. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. No theological arguments, no strings attached, just the gift of eternal life right there. Save me now. You know, it kind of reminds me of that little girl and her father who were driving down the road on a beautiful spring afternoon. And I don't know if you've ever been driving down the road and a bee flies in your car. You ever had that happen? <laughs> now, it's one thing if you're driving by yourself. And you can, you're looking in the rear mirror. It's in the back. Where is this coming? It's going to come for me, you know. But when you have little kids in the room, in the, in the car with you, that's a totally different scenario then. Because they're flipping out and losing their mind. And you're trying to calm them down. you got every window in the car rolled down, hoping the thing would fly out. And you're going down the highway at 65, 70 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour. You know, you're flipping down the highway. <laughs> and you just, you know, the kids are losing it. And it kind of reminds me of this, this story about that. And, and the father, you know, he quickly reaches out, and this little girl is losing her mind, his daughter, and he reaches out and he grabs that bee out of midair, and he squeezes it in his hand, and then he released it. And the girl got scared because the bee still flew right by her, it buzzed right by her, but once again the father reached out his hand again, and he said, look, and he pointed to the stinger that was in the skin of his hand, and he told his little daughter, he said, you don't have to worry about that anymore. I took the sting, I took the sting for you. And it kind of reminds me of that, you know, and... And uh, we don't have to be afraid anymore, do we? We don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of the grave. Because Jesus has already taken the sting. He's already taken the punishment for us. We don't need to fear that anymore. And like the disciples and that thief who accepted Jesus, I really hope that Hosanna is on your lips today. I hope that you are saying that, that you recognize that you have a need. If you don't already, I hope, I pray that you recognize you have a need to be saved. I hope that you have already accepted Christ into your heart to save you. If you haven't, today's the day to do it. Not tomorrow. Today's the day. Save me now, Hosanna. Save me now. I hope you see that today. Thank Him for what He's done. Give Him the honor that, that His name deserves, you know. It's like those early followers who, you know, we worship our king, we lay down what we have before him, and he's kind of moving through our lives, you know, as he did that day, and I, you know, the question I guess I have is, is Jesus triumphant in your life today? You know, when you think of Jesus, can you, can you say, yeah, victory for me, it's victory. Can you say that? I hope you can say that today. And I would encourage you to be like those who received Jesus this Palm Sunday, if you haven't already. Be like those who, who accepted him. Now, we also have this other group of people. You know, what about those who rejected Jesus? What about them? Let's take a look. Starting at verse 39. It says that some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Because I love that. I absolutely love this part of Scripture. You know, at the triumphal entry, you've got these Pharisees, these spiritual, these, you know, biblical leaders at the time, and, and uh, they had understood very clearly what the crowds were saying. They, they understood the implication of what they were saying, what they were shouting. They knew that the crowds were naming Jesus as their Messiah. And in their minds, this wasn't good. This was terrible to them. This was literally blasphemy 
against God. And, and, and Jesus responds to their complaint about it. They said, listen, you know, your disciples are, are, are calling you God, basically, and you need to rebuke them. And Jesus' response, I love the response, when he says that, basically, I'm more than a prophet. I'm more than a teacher. He was saying, I'm God. That's what he was telling them. By his response, he was telling them, I am God here in the flesh. And the only reason a rock would praise me is because I myself am the maker of that rock. You know, the Pharisees had made up their minds already that Jesus could not have been who he claimed to be, and so they killed him. They rejected him. And there's a lot of people today that they've already made it up in their minds, and they're rejecting him. They're rejecting Jesus. You know, the reason that we can praise him is because he's our maker. And so even if people didn't praise him, even if those who reject him, even if they reject him and they don't praise him, guess what? We will, amen? We can't help ourselves but to praise Jesus. And again, what's amazing is that a week after this, this Palm Sunday, a week after, again, one of the thieves nailed on the cross with Jesus. The one accepted him, but the other rejected him, didn't he? He rejected Jesus. He made up his mind already that Jesus was not who he claimed to be. And he just wrote him off as just another crazy man dying for some crime. And he rejected his claim to, to deity and rejected his claim that he was the Messiah or the Savior. And so, you know, through Jesus, it's amazing, though, because Jesus was so close, wasn't he? He was so close to this thief, and the gift of eternal life was right there. It was right there in front of him. And Jesus' offer to him was no different than the other. But that thief rejected him. And Jesus is so close to people today. He is so close to some of the people that I love so much in my life. He's so close to some of our friends and family. As their creator God, their Messiah. But, like that thief on the cross, they reject him. He's so close. You know, during the presidency of Andrew Jackson, there was a, a, a postal clerk. His name was George Wilson. And George robbed a federal payroll from a train. And in the process, a guard was killed. And so the court convicted George Wilson. They sentenced him to hang. Now, there was a lot of public sentiment that started growing against capital punishment at the time. And so this movement started to, to basically try and secure a presidential pardon for, for George Wilson, which was his first offense. And eventually, President Jackson intervened with a pardon. Now, amazingly, George Wilson refused the pardon. And since this had never happened before, the court actually, the Supreme Court was asked to rule on whether or not someone could actually, you know, deny or reject uh, a pardon, a presidential pardon. Can I refuse a presidential pardon? And Chief, John, there's a Chief Justice by the name of John Marshall, and he handed down the court's decision. This is what he said. He said, a pardon is a parchment whose only value must be determined by the receiver of the pardon. It has no value apart from that which the receiver gives to it. George Wilson has refused to accept the pardon. We cannot conceive why he would do so, but he has. Therefore, George Wilson must die. George Wilson, as punishment for his crime, his sin, he was hung. And the Supreme Court said that a pardon must not only be granted, but basically a pardon also has to be accepted has to be received. You see, friends, we live in a world today that doesn't recognize Jesus for who he is. And even though a pardon has been given, people still refuse it, don't they? I mean, we did. You refused it until the day you accepted it. And they rejected the idea of this world, of Jesus as Lord and Savior of the world. They pass. Jesus off as, as, again, just maybe this prophet or a religious, moral, good moral teacher. 
they completely ignore his words and his works, and in their minds, they actually see our praise toward a made-up God to be crazy. And in the cultural climate we live in today, guys, they're, it's, it's to the point where they're trying to keep Christians quiet. But here's the thing, and we don't have to worry about that, because here's the thing. Understand that even if they could stop our voices, even if they could keep us from praising God, all of creation would still worship and praise Him. We need to understand that God's future plan for His creation, for you, for me, uh, it's going to happen. The future is going to happen one day, whether people want it to or not, whether they believe in God or not, absolutely nothing is going to stop God's sovereign plan. Right. And so, why not be one of the ones that's accepting Him? Why reject Him? Why reject Jesus? It kind of leads us a little bit to our, our next our point. I, I want to last, I want us to take a look at those who have missed what's happening altogether. Let's take a look at this scripture here. Starting in verse 41, it says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, if you would have just known. But now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. And shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou hast knowest not the time of thy visitation. Listen. Probably the largest group right here. This is probably the biggest group of people in our own, so our own society today. The largest group of people probably that day. The bystanders who saw Jesus enter Jerusalem, but they didn't really understand why he was there. Maybe they weren't really paying that much attention. They'd heard about, you know, with the Passover getting closer, the road to Jerusalem, it would have been, it would have been pretty busy. It would have been packed. Uh, people coming from all over, and there must have been a lot of people there that day that wondered, again, what is going on? You know, what is all this about? What's going on? Maybe they heard. Of, of all the things that Jesus had done. Maybe they didn't witness it, but they heard about it. And they were spectators. They were undecided, maybe, in what to think about. I mean, you know, when Jesus, it says, when he looks up at Jerusalem as he approaches, he knows what's going to happen in the future. He sees the day in the future, A.D. 70. He sees that when it will be burnt to the ground and destroyed. He sees the destruction. He sees the future and he sees that the enemy is going to triumph and win over the city and, and it would be destroyed because it didn't recognize the time of God's coming. You see, again, it's amazing that just a week later, at the cross, you have people standing at the foot of the cross. No doubt, yeah, there were soldiers. There were soldiers that were mocking and cursing Jesus, but... I'm sure that there were others there that day who were just kind of going about their job, you know, doing their responsibility. They were told to crucify a criminal. There's three criminals, crucify him. And that's what they were doing. It was their, it was their job. They weren't there to necessarily bless or curse. Maybe they were there simply there just because they were supposed to be. That was what was expected of them. They were going about their regular responsibilities, life. They were just going about life. These people were so close to him. Imagine that. Just going about your regular day, and he's right there. The Messiah is right there. Just feet away. The Savior of their soul was right there, seeing a chance to make some money. They disregard what's really going on all around them. And they take the clothes of Jesus, they roll the dice for him, they start gambling over his clothes. Not really paying attention, just wanting to make some money. Like today. People just making money. 
not really considering everything that's going on around them. They were there so close and yet so far away. They didn't accept or reject. They were just simply there, killing time, playing games, maybe entertaining themselves with life, everyday life. Do something to pass the time. Turn on a TV show, go to a sporting event, go to work, make some money. And yet he's right there. My goodness, there's so many people like that today. And I don't know, maybe you might be one of them here today. You, you might be there. You hear, but you're on the sidelines, you know? The sidelines of, of this church thing, God and Jesus. And you claim to see, yet you don't see. You don't curse God, but you're not praising Him either. You don't necessarily deny the claims that Jesus made, but you also don't accept them. Maybe that's where you're here today. You don't shout insults. Maybe you're not mocking him. But you're also not kneeling at the foot of the cross to worship him. And to ask for your forgiveness. Nor do you feel like you should. Because you're a good person. You're here at church because... I don't know, it's the good thing to do, the right thing to do. You're expected to maybe be here today. You sing because you're expected to sing. Everyone else is around you singing. So, hey, I mean, the music sounds good. Let's, yeah, I'll sing. It's some nice, uplifting music and words. I'll sing. And you're so close to the cross. But just passing time. In, in, in reality... Well, I'll tell you, in reality, what's happening is you're not gambling with his clothes, you're gambling with your soul. And that's the truth. Easter is a time of decision. It's a time of celebration for the Christian, but it's a time of decision for everybody else. You've got two thieves crucified on either side of Jesus. One believes and one rejects. One's saved, the other one is lost. It's the perfect picture of decision. That's Good Friday, isn't it? This Easter time, as we kind of think about Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter. Easter is a time of decision. And for each, every one of us here, again, this can be a day of decision. You have to decide today between victory or tragedy. You can decide. You can decide that today. It's either I'm going to accept Jesus or I'm going to reject him. But you can't keep sitting there on the sidelines just entertaining yourself in life, putting your head in the sand, acting like everything is just going to go by me and, and all is going to be right. I have been at the bedside of too many people in the last moments of their life to ever believe that a person can just skate through to the very end and be okay. It doesn't work like that. It's a day of decision. You can call him a liar if you want. You can call him a lunatic. Or you can call him Lord. That's your decision. You know, when Jesus looked up at Jerusalem, it says that he wept. He was heartbroken over what he saw and what he saw in the future. He said, if you'd only known today what would bring you peace. If you only knew. But now it's hidden from your eyes. My friends, there comes a time when it's too late. You and I are not promised a tomorrow. So the days will come, he says. It's going to come upon you and your enemies are going to build an embankment around you and against you. They'll dash you to the ground. They will leave no stone unturned. One stone on top of another. No. Nope. Why? Because you didn't recognize the time of God's coming to you. See, that's the question. God's coming to you. And what are you going to do? What are you going to decide? At the time of his visitation, right now in your life, what are, what's your decision going to be? Jesus saw the future of the city. He knew what would happen. He wept because he knew the city he loved was going to reject him. Now listen, when Jesus looks at you and I today again, 
When Jesus looks at you, I want you to think about this. What does he see? What does he see when he looks at you? Does he rejoice over you? Or does he weep because even though he was so close, you just kind of let him pass you by? You didn't recognize the time of God's coming to you in your life. Jesus is passing by today. And you don't know if you're going to have a chance for him to pass you by tomorrow. Don't miss today. You need to decide what you'll do. How many times have you seen him pass by you in your life? How many of those moments have you had where you, you stop and go, oh my goodness, I shouldn't be here anymore? By the grace of God, and you're like, oh wait a second, I'm talking to God all of a sudden. How many of those God moments have you had and and you just let him pass you right by and you just kind of throw it up to coincidence or, or good luck. How many times have you allowed him to pass you by? Don't let him pass you by again. I encourage you to call out to him today. You know, I'm going to close with this, this, uh, this story a long time ago. Years ago. Uh, how many of you guys have ever been to Niagara Falls? Anybody ever been there? I mean, you want to talk about just an amazing, uh, amazing natural you know, a place to go and just see the power of that place, the river, the water. There was a couple of guys years ago that went to Niagara Falls. These two guys were in a boat. They found themselves caught in the current that was heading towards the falls. And these men, they jump out of the boat and they start to swim for shore. They're trying to get to the shore. And at the last minute, there's some ropes that were thrown out from the shore. They were thrown out to these guys. And one man, he grabs the rope and he pulls, you know, he's pulling, they, they pull him to shore. And then there's another guy, and he, he grabbed a rope, but at the same time, he grabs this rope. He sees this log that's floating right by him. And just out of the confusion, and, you know, the adrenaline, and, and the fear, you know, the hide or flight kind of thing, this man, he's confused, and instead of grabbing the rope and holding onto the rope, he grabs onto the log. And obviously, it was a fatal mistake. Both of these men were in the same position, the same imminent danger in their lives. One was drawn to shore because he grabbed on to the rope. This rope had a connection to land. The log did. The other guy, he clings to this loose floating log and he carried him over the falls. So he was killed. You see, my friends, a saving connection with God has been offered. To all of us, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all in imminent danger of hell. But our lifeline, Jesus, he's the one on the shore, he's throwing the rope, all you got to do is grab it. And yet there's so many times in life, people, we have these logs that are just floating by us. And people are grabbing onto these logs thinking that that's the way. And it's not. Grab a hold of the rope. Understand that this is the hour that Jesus is passing us by. And you can reach out to him. You can be saved this morning. You can join the thief who, who cried out for salvation. You can join the many who are even here today. Who are here. And they've already cried out for salvation. They've been saved because they have that promise now. That Jesus, they'll be with him in heaven. Amen? Amen. How many of you are here glad that you've been saved? Glad that you grabbed the rope of salvation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't you bow with me for a word of prayer as the worship team comes. And I just want to encourage you this morning, as we have a time of altar call, if you're here today and you've never placed your hope and your faith in Jesus, I want to encourage you today to make that decision. To not let this moment pass you by. Don't let this moment, don't let Jesus pass you by in your life. Take advantage of this moment right here and talk to God. Do business with God. If there's an area in your life that you need to do business with God, and I encourage you to do that. Heavenly Father, today I thank you. I thank you for this time of worship, this time where we've come today to honor and praise you for who you are. Father, there are so many of us here today who accept your son Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Messiah the one who you sent, your only son, you sent him to die on a cross for our sins. We put our faith and our hope and our trust in you, but Father, we recognize that within this group, there could also be those 
who have rejected you or who are just kind of going through life. Father, today I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to them right now. That your Holy Spirit would speak to them about their need to be saved. Saved from the consequence of their sin. For the wages of sin is death. That's a spiritual death. That's eternal separation from you. The wages of sin is death, but the gift, Father, that you give us is eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. I pray, Father, that they would make that decision today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around today, I never intend to embarrass anyone. I don't want to do that. I'm not going to ask you to get up and tell us your name. All I've, uh, this is all I ask, that you're just simply honest with yourself and you're honest with God this morning. That you would just take this moment right now and answer a question. If you die today, God forbid, but if you do die today, where would you go? Would you go to heaven? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt that you would go to heaven today? And if you can't honestly answer that, then I want you to be able to just take this moment right now. Don't let it pass you by. Take this moment right now and make sure don't leave this place without knowing for sure that your home is in heaven when you die. It's not about anybody else around you. This is about you and God right here. And if you feel the need to say, you know what? I've never placed my hope and trust in Jesus and been forgiven of my sin. I don't know that I have that promise of heaven. Today I want to make sure if that's where you're at today, this is between you and God alone, I want you to just quickly do this. All I'm going to ask you to do, every head bowed, every eye closed, just raise your hand and put it right back down. I'll, I want to lead you in a prayer today, a prayer of salvation, and you can just pray to God and ask Him to save you. That's all I want you to do. Slip your hand up and put it right back down. How many will raise their hands today for salvation? Say, Pastor Larry, pray for me. God bless you. I see your hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Amen. Say this prayer with me this morning, okay? And I just want you to mean this from your heart. A simple prayer I said when I was a young boy and I accepted Christ. Just simply talk to him personally, just like this. Let's, let's just go to the Lord right now. <laughs> Father God, I know that I have sinned against you. I know that I'm a sinner. I confess my sin to you right now. I have sinned against you and I failed you. But I thank you and I believe that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die on a cross as a sacrifice for my sins. And I thank you for that. Forgive me of my sins today. Please forgive me of my sin, Father. I believe. I believe that you sent your son Jesus, and I believe that you raised him from the dead three days later on that Easter Sunday morning, conquering death and hell so that I, too, even though I die, yet shall I live eternally in heaven. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. Help me to live each and every day. Help me to live for you from this day forward as one of yours. And it's in your son's name that I ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with us this morning? Listen, if you raise your hand today, if you said that prayer today, you can know that the angels in heaven are rejoicing over one person. Over one person. Amen? Amen. Let's worship God this morning. Listen, if you still feel the need to come and pray.
Uh, please do come and use, utilize the altars this morning. Let's worship God. Thank you. 